So it's a pleasure to be back after this short break with Claire Bloom that will close the day with uh, a talk on uh, H0 and galactic lensing. I can't believe it, you guys actually came back. <laughs> So thanks. Um, first, thanks to the previous speakers for breaking uh, the barriers of time. So now I know I don't have to respect them at all. <laughs> then again, I'm going to talk about something that is A, very simple, and B, a large part of it actually for sure exists. So it means I need much less words to explain it. And uh, if I can do it in 10 minutes, I'll try. So let's see. Um, so I am talking about uh, mostly this first paper here and maybe a little bit in the end about um, the second paper. And the context is age not, the, or the age not tension, if you want. Um, and just to summarize the status of the age not tension uh, recently, then as you all know, so we have from Planck 18 and also from, from galaxy clustering, um, a measurement of age naught that is called the kind of the early measurement, which is around 67 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And then there are um, what are so-called late time measurements, which are supernova type 1A um, um, luminosity estimates calibrated with cepheids and also additional calibration methods. This is a completely classical distance ladder kind of measurement. So you all know supernova type 1a are absolutely not measurements of edge naught. They can measure the slope um, of the luminosity distance ver versus redshift in uh, lambda CDM, but the measurement is completely uncalibrated. Edge naught is the calibration that you need for that measurement. So supernova time type 1a are not measurements of edge naught. But if you can calibrate, if you can anchor the distance uh, measurements with something like Cepheid, some, some local candle, um, some local standard candle, then you can get a measurement. This particular case is around 73 from the risk group. There have been many updates and other measurements, but um, some of them tend to converge here. It's, it's, it's somewhat controversial, but definitely that's, that's if you want the main piece of the age no tension. And to draw your attention, the nominal uncertainty from that group on the measurement is at the ballpark of, you know, plus one is man, uh, one, 1.3 kilometers per second per megaparsec. So that's kind of the precision. And it's in about four sigma tension with the CMB measurement, depending who you ask. Then there is one additional, so there are several other ways to try to measure edge not locally. One that is, one way that is notable and is completely independent from supernova type 1a is by using strong lensing of galaxies by other galaxies. I'll explain this later. And that measurement of lensing time delay, so the collaborations that have done it include Holy Cow, you've heard about, and TD Cosmo, which is a collection of essentially six projects that are collaborating to put together this measurement. Holy Cow is, part of, is one of these projects. And they have provided additional measurements. This is a one-shot measurement. It is not a distance ladder measurement. It does not need any external calibration. So for me, at least, being very interested about this status of edge knot, this was a natural thing to look at as a theoretician, if you want. There is, I have some chance to touch it. It's not sensitive to some fraction in, in one of the ladders of a distance ladder measurement. It's a one-shot thing. And so my plan in the rest of uh, the 15 or 20 minutes that I have is first to explain how lensing time delays have achieved this measurement. This is 74 plus minus 1.4. I refer you to the first result of the TD Cosmo team, so TD Cosmo 1 from 2019. They have been able to measure edge naught with an uncertainty, nominal uncertainty, that is very comparable actually to the supernova and completely in agreement with the supernova to one sigma. And so, in principle, strengthening the edge knot tension. And in fact, in many analyses, these measurements were just combined statistically. So I'll explain how they were able to measure edge knot, and then I'll explain how later on they were able to not measure edge knot. This measurement is the latest measurement of edge knot or attempt to measure edge knot by the lensing collaboration. It's again TD Cosmo, it's TD Cosmo 4. It progressed in time this way. The error bar grew up by around a factor of three or four. So now it is not competitive with any of the other methods anymore. 
and the central value shifted, but at this level, the central value is not very interesting anymore. Okay, so the point is that these measurements, I'll explain how they can measure edge naught and then that they cannot measure edge naught. And if I have time in the end, I'll comment on what do I think they actually measure, and I think they will also eventually agree and converge on this and, and do this kind of physics. Okay, great. Whoops. Stop me for questions anytime. Feel free, and uh, it should be fine. Um, okay, so I, I want to first explain how lensing analysis. So maybe I should just say in a word, my goal is for when, when we finish this, in a few minutes, you will understand this measurement. You will understand what happened to change the measurement here. Basically, what happened is half of edge no tension has just evaporated. I think that's kind of interesting and important, and I'll try to, to have you understand that. So that's my goal. Um, okay, so this is a little bit of a, um, um, a busy plot. <laughs> But I think, I hope we, we can manage. So what are these lensing measurements? You can Google them uh, any time if you want. The basic idea is that um, the collaborations look on the sky for strong galaxy lensing, that is, cases where a lensed galaxy, a lensed background galaxy, you see several images of it. So in this case, typical case, four images. And the galaxy that is the actual lens that gives the gravity well for, for the bending of light is this um, kind of uh, orange uh, patch in the center. This would be typically a massive elliptical galaxy. And the galaxy in the background can have various types. The important thing for us is that in addition to stellar light, which in the lensed image is this kind of arc picture, you also have a very bright source in the center, which is a quasar. Okay, there is a bright quasar in the, in the lensed galaxy, and you see it four times. And you are probably all familiar with the basic lensing picture, so if I turn this to the side, and I look at the projected geodesics for just two of these images, for example, we would be the observers here, this would be the lensed galaxy, this would be the actual real position of the source galaxy, Light geodesic number one goes from the source, is bent by the lens and reaches us, and is observed at an angle theta one. So the projected image sits somewhere here. The other geodesic goes from down below, is seen at some negative angle theta two, and is projected to the other image. So this would be the two images. And um, great. So in the straight line in the middle is the one connecting us, the observers, to the lens. That's the reference with which we, we measure angles. Now, the true position of the source is unknown. We've got to model it. And the true position of the source would be with some angle beta. And these angles, in general, they sit on a two-dimensional sky. So let's call it theta x, theta y. So the information is a pixel map in two dimensions, typically for these systems of the order of uh, 10 to the 4 HST image, um, pixels. So quite a lot of information. Around 10 to the 4, so there are about 100 pixels. This whole thing um, is of order. The distance between the lens and any of these images is around one arc sec. And if you check the resolution of HST, then um, the whole image is around 100 pixels for this. Actual information that is not null occupies much fewer pixels, but can still reach hundreds, I think, easily. Okay, so there's a lot of many pixels of information, and this is really 2D, and it's, uh, the source is not a point. It's very important that the source will have some finite arc to help you try to solve the lensing problem. So, generally speaking, there are two observables that you must have if you want to turn this into a measurement of age naught. Observable number one is basically the pixel map, so the image. What we have, we have a set of pixels theta, vector in 2D, that are illuminated, so we see intensity of light coming from there. And our lensing model reconstruction problem amounts to solving this equation. Okay, which is just the geometry that you see here. We need to find some ansatz or a model for the true source position, we don't know, that's a model parameter. We add to this the deflection angle. Deflection angle is this gap 
between the observed angle theta and the assumed source parameter beta. And so the lensing, the lensing reconstruction problem amounts to finding the solution for the deflection field alpha and the assumed source pos uh, 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 position beta, so to reconstruct the, the pixel map that you see. How does this connect to physical observables? Um, where th this deflection, what do they do in practice? What they need to do, they need to assume or model the density profile of the lens. Let's call it rho, just the total matter density of the lens. And what they're going to do, the, the relevant parameter is the um, um, column depth of the mass along the line of sight. So I just need to do an integral, a line of sight integral of the density field along some angle theta. Okay, so I just integrate along the z direction of the density field as a function of the position from the center of the lens, which is a function of the line integral. Okay? So just a line integral of the, of the density of the lens. However, importantly, this kappa is a dimensionless column density. It's normalized by some cosmological parameter. It, this is called the critical density or critical surface density. And I've written it here. So if you can model rho, then the ratio of your model density with the critical density is the object that you need to solve the lensing problem because this kappa is a divergence of the deflection field alpha. Okay, so what you're going to do, you're going to assume some density field, obtain your kappa, and from this you need to invert this to find the deflection angle alpha, and you're essentially done. Okay, if you have alpha, you have another thing which is the so-called lensing potential. So the convert, this is called convergence, the, the normalized column density is called convergence. And so it's the divergence of alpha and it's the Laplacian of the lensing potential. So that's the inversion problem, okay? You want to solve this problem for a model of rho. That's the first step you have to do. Now, cosmology lives inside of, of uh, critical density because this integral is astrophysics. This integral is an integral over the density field of the lens. We know very little about this from first principles. We have to just model and measure it out. And this is what we would really like to get to. Critical density is just G Newton and a product of angular diameter distances, which are written here. So DS is angular diameter distance between the true source and the observer. DL, angular diameter distance from the lens to observer, and DLS is between the lens and the source. Angular diameter distance are proportional to 1 over H naught. So if you could measure any of these, and you know the redshifts, you've had a measurement of H naught. Now, what's the problem? The problem is observable number 1 is only sensitive um, to convergence. Convergence takes cosmology, but it's normalized by the actual mass of the lens, which you never know. So you can never measure cosmology just from this part. You measure the normalized cosmology normalized by the mass of the lens. Therefore, you need the second observable. Second observable has to do with the fact that these quasars are variable in time. So if you would plot the intensity oops, of light as a function of time, for any of these images, you'll get some light curve, say something like this, for that image. And then you'll get a displaced light curve, say something like this, for that image. And the point is that these are the same light curves displaced in time, displaced by some time delta t, let's call it delta t i j. It's the delta t between image i and image j of the pulsar. Okay, now here is the, the pretty thing. You can compute this delta T ij, and it's given by cosmology again. This is called the time delay distance, and it's again up to known redshifts. This factor, time delay distance, is proportional to a ratio of angular diameter distance. So this is the holy grail if you want. This is the cosmology. This cosmological factor comes multiplied by ob objects that you could model in the lensing reconstruction problem. Okay? So if you want, the lensing problem is dimensionless. H0 cancels out with cosmology. Okay? Rho cancels sigma. Angles are dimensionless. Time delays have dimension time. And so one parameter of order time remains. 
that parameter is essentially edge naught. Okay, or one over edge naught. So that, that's what happens. So you've got to have both one and two, and then you model alpha, you plug this alpha that you got from the image into this big square bracket, you measure time delays, you divide your measured time delays by the big bracket, you get time delay distance, you get age naught. That's No, um, but it is affected by it. You can see that the time delay would go to zero, for example, if you didn't have, obviously, many images. <laughs> so it's, 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 it, the time delay is acquired um, from two things. First, just geometrical difference in the actual traverse distance along the geodesic, between different geodesics. And the second is just gravitational time delay. The, the fa it's a factor of two if you add them up, essentially, okay? So the time delay is really in, intrinsic to the system. However, it experiences a stretch. And, sorry, does the eye gradient correspond to one? Mm. So in, prin in general, you'll have, for instance, in these systems, four images. Let's call them A, B, C, and D, to follow the notations of the collaborations. I and J would be some combination. So I could be A, and J could be B. That's the idea. And, um, Really, when we talk about time delay, it's time delay of the actual quasar. So again, you have some essentially constant you know, smear of pixels that are illuminated by the galaxy. This is essentially stationary, and the bright lamp in the center is pulsating. So we really care about the specific positions of the pulsar to get that part of the measurement. But we have a lot of information to get the first part of the measurement. More questions? Okay, so I'm done with the first part, hopefully, and you understand how they can measure edge naught. Uh, in terms of, like, uh, first of all, I guess, are they staring at these quasars, or are these images continuously? Uh, do they come back every uh, so often? Kind of a hot delays that we're seeing? I think the time delays we're talking about here are at the level of... Uh, of tens of days, I, I would need to remind myself exactly to tell you. We can estimate it, uh, I mean, you can estimate it essentially from here and from the fact that alpha is of order the angles, which is arcsec, so we could put the numbers if you want. But I think we're about tens of days, roughly. And uh, the variability time of quasars is, uh, is different from system to system. It can be longer than that, um, but I won't talk at all about the experimental difficulty to, to measure this. But, but you, it's easy if you Google images this thing, you, you'll get both things and you can kind of see for your, with your own eyes. I mean, it's not that these things are very nearly close by and it's very hard to get, to get out the signal. They are clearly displaced and you can see it. Yeah? You mean the, conver the convergence? In the convergence, it's, there's essentially the sort of spherical symmetric mass monopole. If we were to include other features what, of the shape, do, mean, they, do they not matter? Is, I mean, this is a function of theta, Yeah. right? So, so I'm not sure what you mean by a mass monopole. Well, in the sense, the, I mean, if the lens is a spherical galaxy, mm -hmm. then it's a good sphere. But uh, if the lens has an ellipticity, would that affect the image? Definitely, and it does. So uh -huh. without ellipticity, you would not get four images. You'll get two. If there uh -huh. was a point source, you'll get two or just an arc. Uh -huh. The reason that you get four is because there is some ellipticity, and I it's see. important. So you've, um, we, we, we are not going to ever assume that this uh, mass distribution is spherical, and it's not. It's, it's elliptical at the level, you know. Oh, sorry. So the R is along each path. The R... The R, this is a simplification. So, oh, so okay, really fine. what you want yeah, is yeah, the fine, actual fine. distance from, from the center of gotcha. the lens. Okay, That's fine. right. Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is how they measure lensing, and now how they cannot measure lensing. The problem is that this is an inversion problem. You, you've got some derivatives there that you need to invert, and that is degeneracies. And uh, a very famous degeneracy is, is the mass screen degeneracy. Often people call it differently, but uh, I cannot say it because I have an accent. Degeneracy. Degen <laughs> or MSD. 
Um, of course, the collaboration is aware of it, but I think some aspects of this were not properly taken into account. And so here is the degeneracy, it's as follows. Um, suppose that you were able, or you, th you thought that you were able to reconstruct a certain mass profile um, for the lens to solve your lens and reconstruction problem, and you got some mass result, you got your kappa, you got your um, you measured your time delay and you got H naught, okay? Now the problem is everything hinges, of course, of cali on calibrating the square bracket, which is just the image reconstruction. But that has the following degeneracy. This kind of model, let's call it raw, let's call it raw of R for simplicity, but I never need to assume that it's spherical. Everything is going to hold if it's not. This is completely degenerate with an alternative model with a smaller galaxy, if you wish, less density, a modified source coordinate, so if this was beta, this will be a different beta, I'll give it a name in a minute. And however, the same theta, so this was theta one, this was theta two, we saw images, and for this modified model, we see exactly the same images but what we need to do, we need to take this density profile and add to it an infinite mass screen. Essentially a screen of mass. Imagine that I take um, on the constant redshift uh, slice where the lens sits, I just put, I wrap around a great mass screen, a, great con a big concentration of mass screen, just adds a delta function into my convergence. So what does it mean? And this, this formally, mathematically, has to go on for, in, for infinity. So that is a mathematical degeneracy. What does it mean? If I had here kappa of theta and it solved my lens infrastructure problem, this is a completely equivalent to, and let's call it beta. That was one model. It's completely equivalent to another model. I can call it kappa lambda. And that is just lambda cup of theta is the same guy that was here, plus one minus lambda, and I have beta lambda, which is just an isotropic stretch of the original beta. That's just a mathematical trick, it's known since ever, and um, lambda is a completely arbitrary real parameter, can be even negative in fact. And so what it amounts to, to, to be doing, I scale, let's say lambda is smaller than 1, 0.9, what, what have you. I scale down the, density, the original mass density of the system by a factor lambda, say 0.9, and I add a constant term, an isotropic constant term. What's an isotropic constant term? Well, mathematically, it's the column density you would get when your line of sight traverses an infinite, infinitely thin screen that's independent of theta. Okay, now where is the devil? The devil is that if this yielded age naught, this thing gives age naught lambda, which is lambda age naught. So we are, if this could be true in, in reality, we would be in big trouble because the image is unaffected to any arbitrary accuracy. Nothing is spherical or anything, um, but we just have this orbit lambda for we can move our reconstruction model on, image is completely unaffected, our interpretation of time delays is scaled by lambda. That's the mathematical mass screen transformation. Obviously, I saw how David reacted to this. This is crap, <laughs> right? This way, there are no mass screens in the universe. However, we are not mathematicians, and uh, the natural question to ask, is, you know, okay, so I just said mathematically this thing has to extend to infinity. What if I am evil and I don't extend it to infinity, I just extend it a bit, okay? Just a bit outside of where image information exists. Well, does it also act as a mass screen degeneracy? The answer is yes, it acts as an approximate mass screen degeneracy, right? If I extended it enough, it would be arbitrarily approximately good to what I need. That's the first step you have to do. This is still crap. There are no galaxies like that. But then, um, if you're even like me, you take it and you rotate it, and you replace this by a very large-scale 
diffuse core of roughly constant density. That also does the job if it's big enough, right? If you are, if the, if the region, the angular region where image information exists is far smaller than the radius of the core, you're just traversing the core with your line of sight integral, it also looks like a mass screen degeneracy. So we call this an approximate core MSD. This is a core MSD. You can just sit down and calculate what is the image deformation that something like this does. And the image deformation goes to zero if the radius of the core is big enough. That's it. You can compute and you can check what does the core has to do um, um, you know, to, to, to satisfy the, the image constraints. So, that's, so the mass screen degeneracy is not a problem. It's nothing. This is a real problem, though. Because this now, you look at it and you say, hmm, <laughs> I wonder if galaxies actually could have this kind of structure. Um, so how much time do I have? Am I, I do want to respect the time. Yeah. OK. Um, so in practice, for, so we, we compute it in the papers. The details are not important for the resolution of the actual campaigns today. Um, slightly depending on exactly how this cuts off at large radius. Um, the typical radius of the core, let, let me, um, yeah, let me make a, a projected plot. So, um, yeah, suppose, suppose I want to draw the density profile, the actual assumed density profile as a function of radius, and let's do everything spherically symmetric just to make life simple. Again, we don't need it. This thing works even if it's not spherically symmetric. Um, and suppose initially I have some approximately power low density profile. Typically one of our squared because rotation curves are flat. Um, and, and this was assumed a featureless power law, featureless power law is one of the fiducial um, pipelines for the collaborations. So suppose this, this is the case. Um, if this was to, to, to put scales in it, um, so let's suppose that the projected Einstein angle fall somewhere here. What is the projected Einstein angle? All of these kind of images, when you look at them, they look complicated, but actually all of your images always sit almost exactly along a circle. They don't fall exactly on the circle, but they fall very near to the circle. And that circle is called the Einstein angle. Okay? That's the circle that your image would be if a source was precisely behind your lens. So all the information is always concentrated near the Einstein angle. And so to quantify what you need from the core, it's, co it's convenient to compare to the projected physical kind of Einstein angle. If the core, let's call this our core, if our core is, uh, let's say, bigger than around three, let's say three to five RE, then you're fine, generally speaking. And I'll find with what? Let me be specific. You'll find with this. You'll find with, so, so if you noticed, Adding this, adding a positive mass screen, adding a positive core amounts to taking lambda to be a little bit below one. If I take lambda to be 0.9, the um, edge knot problem is gone from the lensing. So this difference is around 0.1. Um, and so for 0.1, these numbers would be fine with the, the observation. The core has to be a factor of three, maybe four outside of where the, the lensing measurement is. Again, to put this in touch with Milky Way, if you would um, consider the Milky Way to be one of these lens galaxies, it's really not, but it's not totally incomparable, right? So if, if you would assume that this was the Milky Way, this RE would be around five kiloparsec projected for a Milky Way. Those of you who know the Milky Way, five kiloparsec is a messy place. It's, it's a place where baryons and dark matter are more or less the same. We cannot compute this. We can just try to measure it. That's really what is going on for the lensing. The, the information for the image is roughly not far from the transition between its stellar dominated and dark matter dominated. Where I need the core to be then is around 50 kiloparsec maybe. Where in, in the Milky Way, it's, it's quite hard to measure details of rotation curve. It's not different for these ellipticals, which are very far away. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a little bit, it's a little bit uh, ad hoc, the definition. It will depend a little bit on the model. So what am I trying to say? 
Suppose that this was the original profile. What do I need to solve the agent tension? I need to add, to do a, a core MSD, I need to add a core component. Let me take it like this. It is almost flat, and then it falls around roughly the transition radius. Again, the, the, these numbers will change a little bit on how fast I fall. And I need to rescale. When I add this component, I need to slightly rescale down my power loss. So the total, if you want, the total density in the end is going to be something like this. With a slight twist, then it goes back to the power law. It's a very slight bump. So, but how much of this do I need? Um, in principle, as far as imaging is concerned, the core could go on to infinity. If the core does go on to infinity, then most of the mass of the system is actually in the core, and that's a major change to potentially to what we think about galaxies. But we don't have to go there. This is a quite a weak, in, in general, quite a weak constraint. The core can, it doesn't even have to ever touch the baseline model. It's enough. It's enough to have total mass in this core component of the density in the galaxy, which is around 10% of, let's call it, m virial of the galaxy. In the Milky Way, this is allowed. <laughs> okay? For galaxies that are a gigaparsec away, <laughs> this is very allowed. All right? Another, so let me just make a few comments because I'm, I'm basically done. This would solve the age no tension. So core component. Um, kills age no tension from lensing. What happened in this number, so now you will understand the arrow, is that we talked to the lensing collaborations. They were extremely responsive. They put this component in their pipeline. They were brave to do it because this is a degeneracy, and so it's the maximum evil possible <laughs> extra degree of freedom that they could add. So they added the maximum evil degree of freedom. They also have stellar kinematics data. The result of adding this to the pipeline was the measurement in TD Cosmo 4. Central value actually moved here. They found roughly two sigma positive evidence that something like this could actually exist. I don't think they did it right. I would love it to be right. I think they missed something in stellar kinematics, so I think it's premature to, to celebrate that we found it. But I think what is totally clear is that they can't measure edge naught. And I think at least in the next decade, they will not measure edge naught. They will be measuring structure of galaxies and maybe detecting this kind of component. Another comment, um, it's okay to have a cusp, to have, people asked me if um, this idea suggests that these big galaxies have cores and not cusp of dark matter. As far as I can see, it's not okay and it's not what I'm proposing. I'm proposing that these galaxies do have the completely usual cusp that people think about, but in addition to the cusp, they have a very sub-dominant -com sub component that is this kind of fluffy core. So it's perfectly okay to have a cusp. In fact, I think that the lensing measurements themselves are the strongest recent you know, support to the presence of this kind of cusp. Because you can add a core, but you've got to move on the mass screen degeneracy to satisfy the lensing constraint, right? You've got to be something like a power law. You've got to be MSD on the MSD orbit that connects you to a pure cusp. Sorry, Which I just understand what you're saying. Yeah. It's like uh, if you would put like a, if you would put like a larger uh, um, core, you wouldn't uh, fit them. You, you wouldn't. No. Fit I, well, first I would scrub edge not by more. Yeah. And so, so I would say um, uh, all of these measurements agree on. No, H0 no. But let's fix H not to the CMB. Well, if you fix H not to the CMB, then this end. Everything in the pipeline was completely correct. Then the collaboration have measured the core component at the level of four to five sigma. I see. That's the implication of that. However, it's a big assumption to say that everything in the pipeline was correct. There are more things I could talk about this for hours that Sorry. could go wrong. Yeah. Uh, maybe I missed a bit. Can you explain why the central value went down? Um, why it went down? Yeah, so what happened? Yeah. It, it didn't have to. Um, what had to happen, so first what they did, they added in the modeling of the, um, the density profile, they added the possibility of a core profile with two parameters, which is uh, the effective cutoff and the height. Mm -hmm. 
Okay? And so what had to happen, this is a degenerate possibility, what had to happen is that the error bars would inflate. In fact, the error bars now have nothing to do with imaging. The whole thing with lensing is that it has very precise HST imaging. And so they had a very small error bar because of imaging. Error bars now have nothing to do with imaging. They are purely stellar kinematics because as far as imaging is, constrained, is, con is uh, considered, this was a complete degeneracy. So what had to happen is that error bars will grow, and that happened. Mm -hmm. What didn't have to happen is that we'll actually find positive evidence. The positive evidence is from stellar kinematics. So maybe this is really there. So but, what, uh, did they, what did they do before? Because it's not, it doesn't even before look... Before they did not have this. So before, for example, in one fiducial pipeline, uh -huh. They assumed a simple power law for the total mass profile. Yeah. There are other fiducial pipelines that are more complicated, converge to the same answer. Uh -huh. So we, what we take from this is that the lensing tells you that galaxies, massive ellipticals, are close to an MSD orbit <laughs> of pure power laws with power law that is very close to one of our squares. So that's what you learn from them. And my comment is that it's still on an MSD orbit, so it's that up to the, the transformation. Right, but is your yellow number is uh, assuming there is a core, or it's... A it's not assuming, it's okay. adding three parameters to the pipeline. Okay. So it's just allowing the density profile to it's be allowing it. a power law plus something. Okay. Or uh, in, in this case, actually, it's more complicated. It's NFW plus stellar mass to light times brightness plus, the, plus this, this thing. It's the same. So it just didn't exist before. Um, so can, okay. can I say that the fact that the number went down is essentially telling me that the yellow core component is positive? Because it yeah, could have, would it love could have to been have, negative, I, right? I would love to say it, and it might be. Because, um, be, because I mean, in, I was a bit confused by the mention of the core component because I somehow had this mental bias that the core component is dominant in the core. Mm -hmm. But really, the core, compo yeah, yeah. the core component is just sort of the step on the outside. It's and a 10% little wiggle. Yeah, it's and, a wiggle uh, on the outside. And, and, and far out of yeah. where imaging data is. And, and if, if the yellow was negative, then I would have uplifted things, and then there would have been a dip in principle. And that would still it mathematically could have be the been same. A dip. Yeah. It would have been mathematically the same thing yeah. because of the degeneracy. Yeah, it but was the, possible. But the stellar they, they checked it, by the way. They allowed for this to happen. Okay, so they let the, the radius float, and stellar kinematics made the, made the yellow positive. Yeah, stellar kinematics that. is sensitive to this, because stellar kinematics probes another moment of the uh -huh. mass distribution. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Stellar kinematics uh -huh. really probes, you know, V squared GM of R over R, so it's, it's another moment of the mass distribution, uh -huh. very roughly. And stellar kinematics seems to drive the central value to smaller values. I do not believe their analysis. <laughs> I would love to have believed it, but I think that they implemented the, the stellar kinematics part. The imaging part is, is great. The stellar kinematics thing, I think they were a bit too quick on estimating how a core component affects the observed kinematics. So we comment on this with my student, Luca, in the paper here. And I think it needs to be redone. And maybe, you know, the central value will move again. I, huh. I don't know. Huh. Okay. Um, or maybe it wouldn't, I think. But the main thing to take is not the central value, it's the error bar. The error bar takes this measurement out of the game. It's really, it will never be a two sigma thing, um, you know, unless it moves by huge amount, which I, I doubt. Could, couldn't, in principle, stellar kinematics fix that, the, that yellow core component such that you then yeah. can, in, in principle? principle, the answer is yes, but in practice, if you ask me, so, so now these error bars are fixed by stellar kinematics. However, now these error bars, as I said, are not really practically relevant. They're too big. The minute they'll become smaller, I and others <laughs> are going to be worried because stellar kinematics has its own degeneracies. It has velocity and isotropy degeneracy, which is now, I think, again, not taking fully into account by the analysis. The analysis are too simplified, and I think as long as the error bars are big, I don't really care. <laughs> when the error bars become small, we have to look at it and, you know, maybe it will affect things, maybe not. But that's where you are. You need to do stellar kinematics. Um, I, I'll just comment. There are other things that could help systems with more than one source to some extent break this degeneracy. There are not relevant systems right now, not of this type. There is one with two sources, but it's not relevant. That's a whole story we can discuss. That's the next work we are doing, trying to see what you can do with multiple sources. 
uh, yeah, is there only a single uh, quasar uh, strong memory that they use? Or no, the, 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 they, these the numbers are already using seven, I think, and, and combined. We can't measure. We can only put from the data, purely from the data, we can only bound, we, we can only get a lower bound on the core radius. What they all kind of agree on, so all of them tend to bias age not high, if you want, uh, maybe high is the correct value, right? So all of them measure um, an age not that is higher, either roughly equal or higher than CMB. None of them is smaller. So all of them kind of want a positive core and are scattered around a 10% positive goal. More detail, but these time correlators are always within one system, right? It's not two quasar lenses. No, it's one system. It's two images of the same quasar. That's crucial. Yeah. No, because the key about having multiple sources is that you need, you see, um, here is what multiple sources do to you. Um, you see, you have one intrinsic density profile of the lens, and it is normalized by cosmology, but the cosmology actually kills which source you are. So if you have two sources, but it's crucial then, here is the funky thing, angular diameter distance are not monotonous functions of redshift. So this is why that's the devil in the detail there. It's, uh, it's not enough for your two sources to be a different redshifts because angular diameter distance in f of w, if you plot d as a function of z, it does something like this. And it just so happens we live in a world where all of the systems are around the zero of the derivative. <laughs> and in fact, if you plot, you know, you can check this strongly actually limits what you, what you can really do. It just so happens, you know, that giga years is roughly not far from the peak and we are all next to the derivative. Mm. It limits by about a factor of 10 the would-be efficiency of having multiple sources to solve the problem. The one system that has two sources is the same, different redshift, but same angular diameter distance to a percent accuracy. There are other systems and we can discuss. Um, and, and another thing pops up, if I have <laughs> just a less than a minute to comment, another thing happens which was never taken into account as far as I know which is weak cosmological external convergence. It's the fact that there is an effective mass screen for these systems. I said that there isn't, but there is. It's coming effectively from weak lensing from large scale structure along the way. And that is a cosmological random variable. The size of this, this is called external convergence. The size is not negligible compared to the age no tension. You've got to be super careful about this. And what we're finding that nobody, as far as I know, checked differential external convergence if you have two sources. That's also the, the middle, the, 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 the difference is, is also a random variable. It's small, but it's going to be an absolute limit to what you can do in the future. Okay, I'm done, so if the, yeah. So now I'm going to pass the microphone to David, who was supposed to be the discussion leader. We're already like half an hour past it, so it's up to you if you want to let other questions. Uh, uh, raise your hands, are we done? <laughs> no, okay, I'm joking. Um, I actually honestly thought we'd be done. I don't have much, I don't have much else to say unless... Yeah, Matthew. Um, what are TD Cosmos' own estimates of their ultimate precision? Do they, you're, you said if they go to lower, to greater, greater precision, that, that you wouldn't trust it or you'd be worried about it? What, what do they say? Because they must, they must, I mean, I was just looking at one of their papers there, and it seems that they are continuing to study this degeneracy. They're definitely, and they're continuing, and I think I really, I'm looking excitedly for them to do it because I think. If you ask me what I think they will measure, and I think they're going to converge, but you should ask them. In particular, Simon Biro and Fred Corban and uh, Sherry Suyu that are that very dominant on, on that. Um, I, I think they should because I think what they have is an unprecedented measurement of the structure of galaxies. In particular, 
I don't think they will ever measure edge not. Ask them about this. I don't think they will like, but I don't think they will ever measure edge not. But I think if you give them edge not, it can be from Adam Rees or it can be from Planck. If you give them that you, and combine it with their measurements, they have an unprecedented measurement of galaxies. And I don't see why they can discover something completely new when they do it. Nobody has ever measured, and we have no idea that galaxies are power laws. That there could be surprises. That's what I think will happen. Actually, if you look at the titles of the papers, they have changed from measurements of edge not to measurements of edge not in combination with the profiles of galaxies. To me, the future is using cosmology to measure the structure of galaxies with, with lensing, and I think there is a lot of work to try to do it. Um, they have many ideas how to try to mitigate systematics with stellar kinematics. Let me comment on the one thing I looked carefully at, is how it was implemented in the pipeline for the core. We had many discussions with the TD Cosmo, with Simon Beer, who wrote uh, quite a big piece of the pipeline. Um, and we're not fully in agreement yet. <laughs> about this. So I think this is, this is under debate, but this is in the detail. I think everybody agrees that um, proper account of mass screen degeneracy has to be added. You can do it this way, you can do it another way. And you have to, now you're in the hand of stellar kinematics, you have to model. So I'd say this is under active, active research. Thanks. And second question, supernova data. What, what are your thoughts? I, di I, didn't, I, I, have, I, I would love it to be true. That's, uh, I don't know, it was complicated for me. I, I can tell you, I'm really excited about this age not thing. I think we don't understand lambda CDM, just an effective theory, it could break down. Supernova for me, as a theorist, is complicated because I, you know, it could fall on the calibration of the period luminosity relation for surface near and, and far. It's just difficult, it doesn't mean that there is an error. I don't, I don't know how they do it, so I have, I have no comment. This was relatively easy and uh, you know, to, un to understand, and we, we now have a lot of work. Supernova, I don't know. Thanks. Just a curiosity, uh, what about all other systems as lens, like a cluster or... Uh, oh, yeah. great, thanks yeah. very much, Pasquale. What about clusters? There are cluster measurements. The original idea to measure cosmology from time delay was, had to do with clusters. Um, basically seeing multiple images of a supernova behind the cluster, it was done. There is a paper by uh, Grillo et al. That, that, that tried to do it, and Sherry Suyu from Holy Cow that have tried to do it. Um, the mass model is way more complicated, so you have systematic uncertainty related to that. Um, the one type 1a supernova that was, uh, so it just happened to be a type 1a, this doesn't matter, for the supernova that you lens, had something like 89 sources, out of which around 30, maybe 28, are independent sources. All of them are around here. Um, but so they, could, they break C minus one by about around 0.3. But that analysis is really sensitive to our next work, which is um, differential cosmological external convergence. Um, so right now it's not, it, by the way, it found the nominal value it had is around 74, I think, but with a very big error bar. And uh, I think that the real limit is going to be A, the, the mass modeling, which it's difficult for me, I didn't work on it and uh, the differential external convergence, which I think, I think the limit of this from our calculation now um, is going probably to be in the ballpark of a um, um, few percent, probably 2% roughly on age naught. So if, if you can really mitigate it, you have a chance with clusters. So, but this is in progress. Thanks. Let's thank Kfir again.